Well, hello everybody and welcome to our next part on this uh, ongoing series on the Marantz 2500 receiver. So the first thing I want to do is uh, kind of thank you all for all the great comments and everything, uh, for the donations you all made, all the kind words, everything. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I really appreciate it. And of course, I <laughs> can't go without mentioning the... Uh, <laughs> comments I made on capacitors I knew it was going to open a can of worms and of course we got a lot of discussion going on those I broke the rule didn't I you know my rule never three things you never talk about in public politics religion and capacitors and what I do I talked about capacitors so <laughs> there you go but in all seriousness a lot of those really really high-end expensive capacitors I don't really use them and uh, I won't go so far as to say they're total snake oil or that they're <clears throat> people waste their money. I mean, that, that's up to the individual. It's also up to those who have a lot better hearing than me. All I will say is that scientifically <clears throat> testing, you know, with, with test equipment and so forth, I have yet to be able to prove that the more expensive capacitors are any better sounding or performing than some of the lesser really good quality capacitors that are out there. Um, <clears throat> and I would even say in some instances I have kind of observed that some of those ones, I, I mean especially like the ones that look like the big beer kegs with wires coming out of them, I'm not sure the name of the companies, but they're really really large metal capacitors. I think they have their oil capacitors. And a lot of times they get so big that they don't fit right in the, you know, you see them normally in tube gear. You don't really see them in uh, solid state gear. But, uh, you know, I, they're hard to fit into the amplifier unless you design it for that size of capacitor. <clears throat> you have to deal a lot with, um, with more problems with noise and so forth because they have a bigger surface area to pick up noise. Um, so I've just never really worked with them a whole lot <laughs> and uh, so I'm not a real good person to ask about those well I what I will say is the ones I have worked with you know the niche cons and so forth the the pine the uh, Panasonic and I've used Solon in the past uh, I don't know those are the ones that look kind of like this <clears throat> I have a few of them and actually they're very well-made capacitors. They're very good quality. They do cost more. Um, again, it's debatable whether they sound better than a really good orange drop capacitor, you know, this type of thing or something. But they're very good quality, and I do use those sometimes. But that's about the extent of it. I really can't speak for any of the other ones. Um, now, <clears throat> before we get started on our next part of this, <laughs> i got to tell you a little funny story. Uh, if you notice in front of you, there is a Starbucks cup. Um, it's a coffee cup. It's plastic, it's reusable. And uh, my daughters will take these out, you know, and they'll get them refilled and so forth, take them to work or whatever. But anyway, <laughs> so I come in this morning, I hear a loud noise. I get up coming down to make my coffee this morning. And I uh, heard a little noise, didn't think anything of it came into the kitchen and I saw one of these cups like this on the floor of the kitchen thought nothing of it you know and the cat standing there looking at me innocently <laughs> so I'm like okay so there's a cup that fell on the floor I grabbed it like this I picked it up as soon as I picked it up the bottom popped off and all the water went out all over the floor it was actually full Somehow the cat had knocked this thing off of the off of the countertop. It fell the full 36 inches or however long it was all the way to the floor, landed like this and somehow sealed. And the water never came out of it until I picked it up and then the weight of the water pushed the cap off. Yeah. Dag on cat. Anyway, it's living proof, guys. I just know that the world is not flat because if the world was flat cats would have knocked everything off of it by now so there you go anyway silliness aside let's get back to our uh, receiver and uh, see what's up next 
So the first thing I want to kind of show you is the power cord. If you remember when we last looked at that power cord, it was really kind of gray and dirty and grungy and it kind of was getting kind of stiff. Now it looks like brand new. And I'll show you what I use to clean these. It works really well. If you go to, you know, any of your department stores or automotive stores or whatever, you can buy this Armor All Protectant Wipes. And I'll tell you what, you take one of these wipes out and just kind of run the cable through several times and then let it dry overnight. And it turns your cable, I mean, look, makes it look like a brand new power cord. So just a little tip for that. So today what we're going to look at is we're going to look, we finished up checking out the FM tuner and we determined that it was working extremely well. Um, I did a lot more testing of it off camera than I did just with what we did on camera. But now I'm ready to move into the AM and I was getting everything set up for this video and uh, turned, the, turned it on and I started hearing some strange sounds coming out of the AM until finally, eventually, it started doing this. Let me turn it on. Would help if we plugged it back in, wouldn't it? <laughs> All right. Here we go. I'm going to turn the microphone around towards this front so you can hear it better. Okay, we're going to turn this up now. hear that that is all that you get on AM now it failed now I have not troubleshot this yet I kind of stopped right there and decided well this is going to be the next part of our video series on this tuner we're going to actually have to uh, troubleshoot the AM section and we're going to have to try to figure out what that is now I already have an idea of what I think it might be most of the entire process of the AM tuner <laughs> is done on this little chip right here. So really, it could be that chip, but I doubt it. There's a whole lot of transistors in this thing. And as we spoke of earlier, transistors from this era can get noisy, especially if this amp has ever been stored in you know high humidity or real low temperatures, high temperatures, whatever, these transistors can get noisy. The bad thing about that is you can't test them in a normal manner. What I mean by that is you can't just use your meter on diode setting, nor can you use your little transistor or your component testers because they'll still read like a transistor. That noise only happens under load. Now sometimes on some of those uh, bigger higher end um, curve tracers can you see that because when those curve tracers actually use a lot higher currents and so forth and can get the transistor to heat up a little bit and break down and if you know what you're looking for on the curve tracer you can see it but it's really kind of a hassle to do that <laughs> so I'm going to show you how I troubleshoot something like this and I you I really believe and I teach this um, in, not just with ra you know radios and things but in any electronics to divide and conquer instead of looking at this tuner as an entire circuit I look at it as multiple smaller circuits that work together with one another and what we want to do is we want to test each one of those individually and narrow it down to that one section it makes it a lot easier when you're troubleshooting now you first have to understand how a tuner works so that we know how to identify those parts and break them down and test them individually. Now I'm not going to zoom in really close yet. I'm just going to show you the big picture of the tuner. This is AM and FM all together, this part of the schematic. And if you look up here is your RF section. So this is the part that's inside that tuning capacitor, the big tuning gang with the dial cord connected to it and you can see there's a couple of components in here little dual gate MOSFETs now 
those probably are not going to cause the problem because if you look here's your FM antenna and your AM antenna the top one is AM and the bottom one down here is FM and then this is your AM loop stick that's that part that's sticking off the back of the of the receiver and this is all kind of common ground if something up here was failing you would see it on the FM as well when we look up in this upper section up here this is really all FM up here <laughs> and I don't mean that <laughs> the joking way some to some of us it's FM in both ways but this is actually the FM broadcast this is going to be like your um, your IF and your your filters and so forth they're all going to be up in here if we look down here we have this one chip this is that chip I just pointed to you down here earlier down here and this is actually an AM tuner on a chip it has your first and second IF and third IF it has your filters it has your your uh, local oscillator everything takes place on this one chip and if we look on up here when we come out of the output of the chip which I think is pin 12 on this one it's gonna go into this little transistor down here and then this transistor kinda buffers everything and then it goes through another cup decoupling capacitor and it goes on out and that goes out to our audio there's a good possibility that this transistor could be bad um, so really what we want to do is we want to find out is the problem in the IF section here in the detector or is it in the RF section back here and it's a pretty easy thing to do all we need is our signal generator with AM on it and we're going to just use two different frequencies we're going to use a frequency in our AM broadcast band such as 1 megahertz and then we're going to use a 455 kilohertz signal and the 455 is actually our IF or our intermediate frequency so we're going to feed first thing we're going to do is we're going to feed that IF frequency into here we're going to bypass this whole mess here um, if this works then we'll go back and put our 1 megahertz in here and see if it still works I have a feeling if this is bad nothing's going to work because this is kind of the the end of the line here and that's where that transistor is but let's check and see just for the heck of it okay so we have our signal generator set up for the IF frequency which is 455 kilohertz I have a 100 millivolt signal that's really strong for a tuner but it's not really strong when you get start getting into your IF section it's actually very weak but it's it's strong enough that I should be able to hear it I have it modulated I have a 400 Hertz modulation tone so really if I inject that in there we should be able to hear it hear that 400 Hertz tone coming out of the amplifier now how are, how are we going to do that well I'll show you so what I've done is I just made up what I call an a, a RF injection probe it's just something you can make up real quick and I'll show you here the parts that we can use to make one so to make one of these little things all you need is a little female BNC jack like this and you want to have the little ground tab uh, with the nut screwed on tightly onto it and the tab sticks out like that you then need what I'm using is just a one nanofarad capacitor but there's you can use a bigger one or a smaller one it doesn't matter I use this is a one nanofarad I cut the lead off relatively short like right here and then I place it into the end here like this you know but down here and I solder it in then I take a bigger piece of heat shrink like a bigger diameter and I slide it down over the whole thing and shrink it down and then I take another little piece here and kind of slide it over and I just leave about uh, maybe three or four millimeters a couple millimeters that's all out the top exposed kind of like down there and I shrink it down and all it does is just makes a little probe that looks like this 
So there you go. Now the neat thing about this is this capacitor will actually give you some isolation between your signal generator and the device that you're trying to inject the signal into and that's really important because of course you don't want to <laughs> you, you don't want to inject any voltages into your signal generator and ruin it so this will protect that but it'll allow the RF to pass right through now the next thing I do is you can just use your normal coax cable and plug it in like this then I just take a little alligator clip connect it to ground and now we have a really nice little injection probe now if you look on um, let me think if you go back to my uh, Pioneer SX750 video I believe it was we had to use this to troubleshoot it and I think you actually you'll see me using that in that video that was quite a while ago so uh, I think that's what it was but anyway let's turn this thing on and see if we can inject some signals and let's also draw up this schematic and kind of get a better copy of it that we can see what we're going to look at a little bit better okay I hope you all can see that let me move my uh, get my microphone a little bit better positioned and so if we look here here's that Q151 okay and that's an HA uh, what was that an HA HA1197 that is the type of chip that it is and I kind of marked some of the things so here's your RF tank circuit right here so that's that's what this little transformer is if you look in here this is your feed in for your local oscillator and this is your local oscillator coil this is your first IF and second IF and everything else takes place inside this chip your input from your tuning gang which is way up here comes in where this little yellow mark is and it goes into pin 2 of that chip and the output comes out of pin 12 and it kind of feeds up straight up here through this little 1k resistor through this little tantalum capacitor and into the transistor now we could have a problem with these tantalum capacitors but they normally don't snap crackle and pop they normally just pop <laughs> when they go bad they short out and they'll either just blow up or they'll go dead short and it'll just ruin everything and nothing works you won't get any noise so I don't think they're bad there's one here and one here sandwiched in between is this funny little transistor so the first thing we want to do is we want to take our 455 kilohertz tone and we're going to kind of try to feed it into the three legs of these transistors that's going to bypass this whole chip um, if this chip is bad and I feed the signal into the output here I should be able to hear that tone coming out okay I printed out my data sheet and uh, had some information on this and sure enough pin 12 is your detector output so that is detected so that's actually going to be um, no RF by the time it gets out here it's going to be strictly your audio tone so really we would need to inject our 455 oh probably into pin 2 um, or even into one of the like the third IF input pin 8 that's kind of end of the line here before it gets detected so let's try injecting our signal into pin 8 now again if this transistor is really shorting out pretty bad you it'll probably block anything from coming out of this and we may have to go to just with an audio tone in here and try to inject it and see if it works so let's check it out okay we have our crackly tuner turned on let's move the mic around a little and we're going to go into pin 8 okay we heard it so with that and if you notice when I injected it into that last part of that chip 
it was still cutting in and out very, very bad. So it's probably something after that. So uh, let's now go and try to feed an audio tone after that transistor. Okay, we are now going to feed our signal right to the output, uh, right onto this collector here. And I'm hooked up to my audio generator with a 400 hertz audio tone, still using our little probe, and we're going to inject it right in there. Can you hear the crackliness? So let me turn the microphone and let's see what we get. You hear that? Okay. Did I get you in frame when I did that? Let's move this over a little closer. Let's see if we can see it. And you can hear it's very, very clean on the output of that transistor. And if we go to the base of the transistor, let's see here. We can get in there. <laughs> Working around this camera is not easy, guys. And there we go. So it's actually amplifying it, and that transistor is actually working, and the crackling has gone is coming and going. So we know that the signal after the chip is working, but something around that transistor is not working. And we also know that we, if we inject RF into the last stage of that chip, we get really staticky sounding output. So let's do that again, just to prove it. Okay, we're back on the RF signal generator. 455 kilohertz with a 400 hertz modulation going into the third IF stage, the final IF stage of the IC. I'm thinking we have a bad integrated circuit. That's what I'm thinking right now. So with just a signal generator and that little test tool, that's one method that you can use to poke around and inject signals into your uh, front end or your IF and so forth of your tuner. Now, I'm just showing you one method. There are other methods. The other thing we can do is we can use an oscilloscope to do a visual assessment. So we can look at that next. So let's do that too. We're just going to look at some different angles of how we can troubleshoot this. There's no one single way. There's multiple methods. They all work. What works for you best is what you should use. That's what I'm saying. Um, so I'll show you this other way. Okay, we're now look, going to look at the base emitter and collector of that transistor. And we're going to use the oscilloscope. And you can see I'm just touching it with my finger now. And what we're going to see is when I get on there, you should just see your DC voltage. And that noise, we should see that as little noise spikes. But we're going to try to see if the voltage changes or if there's just noise carrying on that voltage. So let's take a look. Okay, I'm, whoop. <laughs> let me get my clip here. And you can see now, I'm connected to the emitter. And if you look at the emitter, we're getting these little noise spikes, but the voltage is, the overall voltage is not going up and down. Okay, so you can see the emitter is, is biased right now. There's, there's voltage on it, but you're seeing these noise spikes. That's telling me that the transistor probably is not bad, but I don't know yet. 
again, noisy transistors are hard to troubleshoot. So let's go to the collector. And now we see you can see right now that's actually the voltage changing on that let's go to the base of the transistor And you can see on the base we have the same signal, only inverted. I don't think this transistor's bad. So now let's look at the chip itself. Okay, I am now looking on pin 12 of that chip. And remember, the transistor will have really no effect on this end of it because you have that resistor and that isolation capacitor between the base of the transistor and this pin 12 of this chip. And you can very clearly see those noise every time you get a snap crack on pop you can see it showing up on there. Now it's very low I'm on 50 millivolts per division to be able to see it. And it's very hard to see but it's in there. Now it's going away. So, whoop, there it goes. See it? There it is. So, pretty much without a doubt, I think we have a bad HA1197 integrated circuit. And that's two different ways to actually troubleshoot it. One is, is uh, visually. Again, you can use an RF sniffer probe, but that kind of that's kind of hard for this particular type of problem. Um, some different things, but again, very quickly we were able to determine that our problem is that chip. So guess what? <laughs> We're on hold with this part of the re restoration until we can get ourselves an HA1197 integrated circuit. I have a few of these HA chips, but I don't think I have one of the 1197s. I'll have to look through my stash and see what I got. So uh, let me do that, and I'll be right back. Okay, I think I found the problem, and it is actually the IF coil L154. And if you look down here, there's a capacitor and a coil in series. And when I took this apart, here's the tiny little coil, and it's a single coil. Came out of the little can here. Okay. And right there's the capacitor. <laughs> look how tiny that thing is. It is shorted. And it, the more voltage you put across it, the harder it shorts. So I've removed it, and what we're going to do is we're going to install an external capacitor on the rear of the board to fix it. So once I get that done, I'll show you what I did, and hopefully this thing will work. Okay, she's all fixed. Everything's working, and you can see... We have a nice waveform up there with negative 37 dBm going into it. Um, I'm picking up a lot of noise from the bench, so don't worry about it jumping around a little bit. But it's tuned in perfectly, and if you look very closely, I removed that tiny little capacitor, and you can see it right here. 
if it'll focus. There it is. That's all it is, just this tiny little tubular capacitor. And I just removed it from the inside of the IF can. And if you look at that little tiny brown thing there, that's a 200 picofarad um, silver mica capacitor tacked on the back. And it works perfectly. I did have to experiment with it. You know, since that capacitor was shorted, I was unable to get a value on it. So usually in these AM receivers, the IF cans, the capacitors usually range somewhere between 39 picofarads and 220 picofarads. This one ended up being 200. Uh, 220 was a little too much. 150 was a little too little. Uh, 200 was right on. So uh, it was able to peek in and it's working really well. So we're going to put this tuner back together once and for all. And uh, I think we're about ready to call this one a wrap or, and do some uh, actual testing on it. Okay, so while we do a little burn-in on this receiver um, to make sure everything's good on it, let's give let's uh, just go over real quickly what happened, um, why this tuner failed on the AM. So that little tiny capacitor is right here, and you can notice this is on your second IF coil. I believe this is a second IF. Um, have to look, but anyway, in this particular one, the capacitor is actually in series with that coil. Um, if you notice, like in some of these other ones, it's in parallel. Now, what that capacitor does is not only does it have to do with this resonant circuit, but it also decouples pin 9 from pin 13. So when this shorted out, or intermittently started shorting out, which was the worst problem, it was intermittent, it would put this coil directly between pin 9 and pin 13. And since this coil is very low impedance, we're talking, you know, less than an ohm, it essentially was putting a short between these two pins. Now right here is a representative, like a, a circuit that represents what is inside of the HA1197 integrated AM tuner chip. And if you look, here's pin 9, and here's pin 13. And you can see when you short them together, this little circuit here is biased on somewhat. And here's the direct input to your output section here. So you can see if we, if we dead shorted here to here, this thing's going to turn probably full on. Now we don't know any of the values of these components, we can only speculate. But essentially, it turned this on the whole way, and it damaged this part of the chip. So the chip was actually damaged, and I, in addition to the original chip, I put a new one in. It worked until this started intermittently shorting out again. And it killed a second chip. So luckily I had several spares, so I put another one in and then started proceeding with more caution. And that's when I got it down to this. Now this took quite a while to figure out because I had the, this was one of the first things I pulled out of the circuit because I could tell I wasn't getting, you know, the oscillator was stopping here. And I took it out and it even, t I swept it with my spectrum analyzer and it even tuned in. It was working. Then you'd put it in circuit, boom, it would it would die again. I even tried checking this with the capacitor checker with the high, with the leakage. I put voltage across it. It didn't matter. Then finally it failed. So just a little word of warning: if you're working on one of these, um, this can short and it can cause other problems in here. But all's good now. So uh, just wanted to kind of share that with you what I found. Okay, I want you to listen and ignore the terrible whistle, but listen to the station in the background. Now, what is the significance of that? I am in the basement of my house at the bottom of a hill, and I am just around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and that station happens to be Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, that is... Oh, approximately, I'd say almost a six-hour drive from here, maybe. Um, pretty far away. 
and I'm picking that up off of the loop stick antenna right here um, down in my basement with all this crap on here making noise and interfering with everything and my soldering station booted up and running and everything so uh, pretty amazing this tuner is working fantastic so that is good news um, we're all put back together here as you can see and I'm ready to put the covers on and turn this thing around and see what this thing can do now and while we were doing this the owner happened to send me another little package and look at this an original Marantz DLB1 Dolby system uh, Dolby decoder module and it plugs back here in the socket that we just repaired the switch in if you recall so now when we go into the 25 microsecond um, de-emphasis switch it'll actually enable that Dolby module so we'll get to try that out as well okay we're all connected up to the dummy load and as you can see down here I have it set to measure RMS and remember this is uh, times 10 so whatever you read there times it by 10 and let's take it up to clipping about 4.92 so that's 49.2 volts so 49.2 squared divided by 8 302.58 watts so we're getting about 300 watts per channel out of this and I, I would expect that um, on this thing because it it can do actually uh, 250 a channel is what it was rated at and it these were very conservatively rated and that was rated at 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz so it doesn't surprise me we hit 300 so we got a lot of little tests to do on the amp but I'm pretty sure it's going to do very well and uh, I may share a little bit of that with you here just uh, for your own curiosity and uh, so let's set some other things up okay I'm not going to drive this one for very long but uh, we're going to just take a look at a square wave I just want to kind of look at the corners on it don't mind all of the <laughs> noise we're getting here nice look at that nice and crisp excellent so that was good okay we're now looking at about 50 watts per channel and uh, we're doing our sweep from 20 Hertz actually from 10 Hertz up to about 25 kilohertz and you can see how flat it's staying all the way along there not bad and you can kind of see the <laughs> the FFT floating across there at the same time so I'm pretty sure this amps gonna perform very well um, I have not connected the distortion meter yet but perhaps we should do a distortion test okay we now have the THD meter connected to one of the channels and it's not reading anything right now so you can see it's just kind of throwing garbage up there we're gonna drive this up to full power and we're gonna see just what kind of uh, distortion we get so here we go coming up there's about 50 watts per channel and there's a little over 100 150 and going up 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 right there's about 300 watts and then as I go up beyond that it goes crazy real quick but you can see right there we're floating at just under 300 watts per channel and it is very very low and there you have it Wow so I guess so far this thing is living up to its reputation so uh, yeah I'm really happy with this so let's put all the covers on now and kind of see what it looks like 
Well, we have the case put back on, got the whole back panel cleaned off. We have the Dolby module fitted in here. And uh, unfortunately, the case got destroyed, but probably in, uh, in that happening, it protected the rest of the receiver. So this thing's going to need a new wooden case on it. It's all cracked and broken, you can kind of see. I cleaned it up a little bit as best I could, but really a new one needs to be built. Um, cosmetically, this not the greatest on the outside, but hey, it was a survivor on the inside, and it's a great receiver on the inside. So let's get it turned around and turn it back on and uh, give it one last look at. Yeah, it's playing pretty good. Uh, wish I could hook it up to the big speakers and <laughs> check it out that way, but you know how that goes. So let's, uh, and if you notice, if you connect over to um, the FM25 microseconds, you notice that the Dolby light comes on now that the module's plugged in there, which is pretty cool. And you can't really, again, I can't play a whole lot on there without having to worry about getting busted. Um, and there's the scope. Now the scope's kind of unique how it works. You really need to use the vertical and horizontal centering when you're using this. So for instance, right now, we're in the audio mode, so it's just showing the audio. Um, it's really just visual effect. If we put it into tuning mode, what you want to do is you want to get off of a station. If I can find a place without a station. Okay, so. Okay, there's one without a station. So what you want to do is you want to take this and kind of center it. And you can see how that little line is centered on there now. And then as you tune into a station, and you can see and there you can show and it just kind of shows when it's tuned and then with the multipath you can kind of see how you can make the so it's pretty cool how it works and then you can see how it takes it off center when you go back to this. You gotta kinda move it. And there's how it works. Now, the thing you need to remember about this is when you shut the oscilloscope off, it is not really off. Um, it does cut the high voltage to the tube, but the filaments are still on. And you have to remember that whenever this receiver is turned on, the filament of that uh, tube is on and because the filaments are raised to that 575 volts um, it's not really easy to put a relay in there to to kill the filaments although it could be done it'd be a lot of work to design something to do that safely and properly um, that being said that scope should last a very very long time in there like that so there you go so there it is. Um, this was a long, drawn-out project, and uh, I'll be glad to see it off my bench, believe it or not, because it's been on there for a long time. Um, I really hope this video turns out okay. Um, it's been shot over a period of several weeks, and definitely going to need a lot of editing and so forth. Um, I'm going to add some more things in and just kind of cut some stuff and add some stuff before I post this video. But as always, um, I'm glad you all watched and I hope it helped everybody out. And if nothing else, I hope it was a little bit entertaining. And as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And until the next project, which there are many of coming, I wish you all well. Take care. Bye-bye. So I put a message at the beginning of this last video here. Um, to let you know that the owner uh, has decided he wants to sell this receiver. Um, he's a collector, he has so many different things and I just think this is, he needs to thin the herd a little bit. So if you are interested in purchasing this, um, go ahead and email me, uh, send me a message 
through my email that you'll see at the bottom there under you know under the comments section there and uh, I'll put you in touch with him now I don't know what he's asking for it I don't know anything um, I'm not getting in the middle of it <laughs> but uh, I just said I would put the word out uh, in case somebody's interested before he posts it on some of the sales sites and so forth so uh, if you're interested shoot me an email and I'll get you in touch with the owner again thanks again and uh, we'll catch you later